What's up, friends? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Joining me once again for this Friday to unfortunately not be discussing the Packers wild card playoff preview, but instead discussing the Packers end to the season is the one and only Mike Wall. You can follow him on Twitter at Mike Wall 68. Mike, how have you been? I'm great, Andy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you bet. Not the conversation that we wanted to be having. Obviously, it would be a lot more fun to be breaking down Packers 49ers, although uh, that would have had some own uh, complications in and of itself anyway. But I uh, want to start, obviously, with Packers Lions. And I don't even know where I specifically want to start. I guess maybe just your thousand foot view, your takeaways from Packers Lions and what kind of went wrong. Everything started with that goal line stand. It's like the week, the week before the Minnesota Vikings game, we had the goal line stand kind of set the tone for the game. Um, the Lions had a goal line stand where two out of the three plays, they blew us up in the backfield because we had poor blocking up front. Their interior, their interior defensive line blew us up. And that kind of set the tone for the game. I mean, it goes along, it goes in, in line with, I think the Packers are the worst in goal-to-go situations in the league. So I don't know if it was any surprise. It's been, it's been kind of a, a fault of theirs. But I thought, you know, specifically when you look at their defense, they just did a great job of beating our interior line all day. Um, I think it took away a lot of opportunities. There's certainly some plays that could have been made in, in the passing game. Uh, I know they've been, you know, been passed around social media, but it, it just it just looks at again a, a lack of execution against a team you just feel that there's so many opportunities against. It was very, very surprising given what you see on tape against uh, the Detroit Lions uh, in the run game and the passing game to see their game plan, their game plan being predicated largely on not you know it wasn't just like the the reverses that didn't work but it was it was all it was like the game plan was kind of based around that theme it didn't really make sense given what we have from a personnel standpoint that's happened a couple times this year you know sometimes they take a shot and they miss and then defensively man like the lions are a good football team offensively they have they have a great offensive line they have two good running backs jamal williams really shoved it down her throat um in that second half they played good enough to win but you know, I'm sure we'll talk about those those fourth down plays. It's always just a head scratcher because it's this confluence of events where your 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 coach has historically put you at a certain position, and contextually you have to understand that it's fourth and one, fourth and two. Do guys need to just go off script a little bit and start playing press in those situations? There's a reason they're playing stack because of the motion, etc. But like you have to know contextually what's going on in the game, and and that lack of that lack of like contextual awareness it, it kind of goes along with the theme of with the Green Bay Packers, like, are you preparing to win in the right way every single week, week in and week out? Like, my answer has been for the last year, no. Um, I think they've proven that uh, week in and week out. And this is just unfortunately a situation where, and the other thing is, Andy, like, dude, they score 21 points, they give up 21 points. You're going to be your 500 football team. Like, call it what it is, right? Those are all really amazing things. And I almost want to break down each of them individually as well. Um, I want to start with what you said about the offense. I kind of have felt that this offense has been lacking a general identity throughout this season. The one thing I kind of felt like Matt LaFleur was trying to accomplish was sort of just taking the weaknesses of the opposing defense and trying to exploit it as best as, as possible. But then you look at this game and kind of, as you mentioned, the two big things that it was sort of the, the new wrinkle that they put in. They did a lot of empty formations, as you noted. They did a lot of, you know, reverses, end arounds, et cetera, uh, which you also noted. Neither of those things really worked in this game and nor was it something I mean the reverses they clearly saw something on tape and Detroit just managed it well or it was they didn't get what they expected something um with the with the empty formations as I think you posted on Twitter um this wasn't something that Detroit like Detroit struggles more when you go in like motion against them or maybe you start with like uh what looks like 11 personnel and then motion into empty something of that ex you know extent instead you just went to the line with five wide or, you know, at least showing some form of it and just kind of went with it. I, I'm really struggling to kind of pick out what is it that Green Bay was trying to accomplish on offense. They're not a power run team. They're not a, you know, they're not a physical team up front. They're not an explosive playmaking team. They haven't exactly been able to pick apart mismatches well throughout the course of the year. Um, they haven't like stacked plays as well as we've seen in some previous years where they're setting things up early in the game to come back and play off of it later in the game. Like this year just seems so disjointed offensively. And I'm maybe, I hope you have an answer because I, I don't know what it is that they are trying to do or are quote unquote doing well. Yeah, my answer would be 
I don't know what I have no idea what they do well. Um, I think all the, I think everything you just said is spot on, Andy. The, the, I, the it's everything starts up front, right? And you started you just kind of look at the way this year went, and they there were some questionable moves on in, in the beginning of the year with the offensive line who they're gonna who they're gonna put where. Yeah. You know, the biggest thing for me is LZ Jenkins move over to the right tackles never made sense to me. Uh, still doesn't make sense. Um, but you have to be something. And it, like the thing that the Green Bay Packers for the last 25 years have been able to hang their hat on is they have a very competent offensive line that can do whatever you ask them to do. Do you want them to five-man pass block? Okay. Do you want them to run inside zone, outside zone, man block? Do you want to run power schemes? Do you want to pull around the side? And this team at different points can show that they're capable of doing a couple of these things. But – you have to, when you have a young offensive line, when you have guys that are struggling on the inside, particularly like Josh Myers, like he regressed this year. There's, no one can say anything different. And it's just, it's not, he didn't become a bad player. He just technically, he regressed. If you're technically regressing, that means that you, as a coaching staff, aren't identifying that and in in, in forcing that on the practice field. Like there is a reason everything happens. So you're not putting guys in position to be successful through preparation. So that's kind of like on the very fundamental baseline thing, Andy, our guys aren't very good at fundamentals, so it's tough to be good at anything anyways. And you don't have a Devontae Adams to bail you out. So that's really number one. That's the biggest thing. You don't have a guy to bail you out anymore. And fundamentally, you aren't where you should be because you're more worried about scheme because that's how most of you got your jobs. Right. You're more worried about drawing up schemes and systems than developing talent. That's the biggest fundamental issue with this football team as far as I can tell. Now, when you get into – what are we, how are we trying to stack plays on top of one another? Like I, I'm in complete agreement with you. At some point during the season, you have to be able to go, all right, if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, we're going to get into 21, 12, 13, whatever you want to call. And we're going to run this basket of plays. And we could even get into one formation. And out of, like, if you just look at, if everybody picture this, if you're in 11 personnel or 12 personnel and you run – five offensive linemen and one or two tight ends hipped off on either side, hipped off off the line of scrimmage. You can run 25, 27 plays out of that formation. All you can eat. You don't have to run a single motion, man. You can know exactly what coverage they're in. Your quarterback can, you can do whatever you want. Watch the San Francisco 49ers, yeah. whatever. It's all you can eat. But we just, you have to take the time to actually be able to execute those things. And we just don't execute very well. It's funny. I was talking to Aaron Nagler earlier this week, and I, I brought up a, a familiar name that many will know well. When things went bad in Green Bay, when Mike McCarthy was here, it got a little bit um, redundant and it kind of got made fun of over time. But when anything went poorly, he would always go say, we have to go back to fundamentals. We got to go back to fundamentals. And it was boring and it was maybe a little cliche and it got the same thing over and over. But he was a million percent right at the same time. And I feel like this team, when things kind of went wrong, they never really got back to fundamentals. And we saw all the same things that we've been seeing all season long, where whether it was poor blocking, poor tackling, um, just some concepts defensively, not having something to lean on offensively. And then you sort of coupled that with undisciplined football, where you've got the personal foul penalties, the one of the field goal, you've got the one with Quay Walker, et cetera. And it just feels like, if you're not fundamentally coached, if you don't have an identity, if you don't have um, discipline, like that, those are all things that point to coaching, obviously. And I, I don't have any other comment on it other than just to say like that, those are all things that point to coaching. Yeah, we did. AG and I did our show this morning. And, I, you know, listen, it's a being an NFL coach is really difficult. Um, Andy, there's, there's really two businesses in the National Football League now that like, I don't think I don't know if fans understand this. Um, you look at let's look at the perspective of a player. I'm going to go off tangent here, but I think you'll enjoy it. Do it. OK, so you, from the perspective of a player, you have three to 10 years to become the best version of you. Now, you've done everything your entire life to get to this moment. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to maximize your ability to win one on one matchups so that you can be successful, get paid more, find, you know, get more cachet, get more popularity, get more, you know, followers on TikTok, whatever it is. But it's all based on your ability to execute. That's it. That's all. That's the only thing that matters. So I can, so I can be a really good player on a really bad team and still be, I can still get rich. I can yeah. still be considered one of the best players in the league. 
I, okay. Now, you have a coaching business. And the coaching business is predicated on really two things. One, loyalty to the man before the mission, because this is a very, very tight-knit group. It's hard to get in and out, okay? So you're loyal to the, the – if you're the position coach, you're loyal to the OC and the, and the, and the DC and the HC. You know, if you're the coordinator, you're loyal to that man first and foremost, more so than the mission. And you are just trying to win. So we are, that's why we've seen now it's gone from all these development coaches, Mike Holmgren, Mike Sherman, uh, McCarthy, development coach, development first coach. You might not like Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy is a development first coach. Yep. He always has been. Now you go to scheme coaches. Coaches that get in, maybe they maybe they had a you know maybe they had a brother that that was that was coaching in the league. Maybe they maybe they're really good at Visio or PowerPoint. Maybe they're a computer software guy. I'm not bad mouthing any of it, but what happens is you get into the league because of that, and now you are learning on the job. And you're when I say learning on the job, you're learning how to develop the guys, the output, the players. The players have three to ten years to get as good as they can. You're trying to win these games in the short term, and you're learning how to develop players while they're while they're wasting their careers on you. So it, there's a there's a really really odd dynamic in the National Football League right now, and it feels like it's kind of every man for himself. And the reason is like there these things are not aligned like they used to be, and it's like it's a real problem in the National Football League. And you have a lot of coaches, and I'm not calling out coaches on the on on the Green Bay Packers. I'm saying in the entire football league, we've talked about this before. There's probably six to eight teams in the league that are culture by design and they're development first and they communicate transparently and consistently. They have a congruent language system for blocking, for tackling, for everything they do, all the special team stuff, everything. And there's everybody else. And if you're part of everybody else, you're going to have the seasons like you have right now. Yeah, no, I think it's totally fair. And I think, yeah, I don't know if you need to do like a better job of marrying like a head coach that's more of a scheme coach with all, you know, coordinators and coaches below that are more developmental coaches. But like, um, it's just really interesting. And I, I think part of it is, you know, free agency and obviously just the growth of the game and how popular it is. And like you said, players can get rich without even having to be on good teams specifically. So, um, yeah, I think all of it goes into the the sort of melting pot of how this stuff happens. But it's really, really intriguing. And I do think Green Bay has got to figure out a way just to be a, be a more disciplined, more fundamental team because, yeah, it's been awesome to watch, you know, Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers for the past three decades. But um, especially when that those you know sort of cash cows are gone, like you've got to do everything else that much better because you don't have that to lean on. It's going to be a different era in Green Bay when that happens in all likelihood, unless something crazy happens and they hit the third one in a row. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's lightning struck twice. I don't know if it can strike again, but just that thematically, do you have the right people? And like, again, players just want to be in a position, you know, be put in a position to be successful, scheme, and be given the tools to find success, right? Development. Yep. Those two things have to merge. You have to have that. And like, and one of the things that, you know, from the Packers standpoint, one of the things that is always obvious is like there, there's a there's a coaching develop. I, I found this out in Miami. There's a coaching development process that needs to take place that just doesn't. And so there's guys that come in that we just talked about. They're really good scheme and they don't know how to. They don't know like the fundamentals of, of their position. So what do they do? They like they, they overemphasize scheme. They scheme 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 and they talk only in terms of scheme. They don't want to hear anything else. Or there's guys that you know know how to develop, know biomechanics, don't know, don't know, don't know the scheme. So they want to minimize that. Right. So you have to be able to find guys at every level that are kind of, it's almost like you have like the Sith Lord, the apprentice, man. Like you got to find one, that, you got to find a guy that kind of complements the other. Otherwise it's a very, very difficult situation because the, the margin for error is so small right now in the national football league that if you're just, if you're just trying to get by with like one of those really important qualities, it's just too hard in this league to win. You heard it here first. The Packers need a better Sith apprentice in 2023 if they want to be successful. So yep. I want to ask you about a few different plays in this game that just kind of stood out to me. The first one was early in the game, the fourth and one to Lazard, where they do the end around. Um, a couple things. Wasn't a huge fan of the decision on that side of the field. I, I get it. I understand they thought this was probably going to be a points game. You have maybe a what, couple, you know, maybe a foot to go on the play. Um, really interesting play call. I know that I, I don't necessarily like these play calls in these situations for a couple of reasons. A it's it, again, you're not, you're, you're 
you're scheming something rather than out physically in somebody. But maybe B is like, if you hand it to Lazard and there's somebody there, there's no out. It's just, it's dead on arrival. There's like, he's in, especially that player. I love Alan Lazard, but he's probably not going to make somebody miss. He's probably not going to outrun somebody. So it's just like, it's either there or it's not. And if there's a one player there for Detroit, it probably doesn't succeed. There ended up being like three or four players there for Detroit, which really made it not succeed. And it wouldn't matter what player that it was ultimately. But um, your thoughts on that decision and on that play call? If that decision's a quarterback sneak, you don't have a. Pro- I don't have a problem with it. Um, I agree. Anytime you're running laterally, it's just it's not an attitude play. To your point, right? It's a, like from an offensive lineman's perspective, you're just not running an attitude play in a situation where you need to. It doesn't. It really just doesn't. It's another thing you just it's such a head scratcher. Um, you saw the great on that play specifically when he goes in motion. You see the safety point to Anzalone and say and and communicate that he needs to hit that gap. I think they they saw that coming a mile away. Um, they did a good job with that generally. And, and to your point, like Lazar, it's not Watson. Like he's not going to run away from him. So it, it's a head scratcher first and foremost because you're running laterally on a fourth and one. Anytime you're running laterally on a fourth and short play, to me, you're just you're sending the wrong message to your football team. Yeah, yeah no, I totally agree. The next play that I wanted to discuss was – Um, One that I think got swept under the rug a little bit and maybe not talked about as much just with the chaos and just disappointment of this game, but the, the, the swing out wide uh, where the running back, I I don't know. I can't remember if it was Swift. I think it might've been Swift, but catches it. And then, um, or maybe it wasn't even right. Was it Swift? Uh, When they split them, it was Swift. Yeah. Okay. So Swift. And then it's Savage and Razul who come up to make the tackle. It was, uh, um, they had what? Was it second and long or third and long in the play? I should have wrote this down. My apologies. But either way, um, they, like Swift just separates both of them, gets the first down, and it just was like such a huge gut punch in the game. And Detroit was obviously able to continue that drive. That, to me, was another play where it just like tackling came uh, back to the, the forefront of this team just hasn't been a good tackling team. And you've just got two guys right there. And we can talk about Joe Barry and scheme and everything all you want. When you have a play where your two guys are right there to stop a running back in the flat, basically, and you can't make a simple tack like that to me was just such a, a gut punch in this game. Yeah. So Pete Carroll's hawk tackling thing came out like 10, 15 years ago. Now it was like, a, you know, how to rugby tackle. And uh, it took over, it took the football world by storm. Right. And this was like one of the most basic, this is like one of the basic drills that they do. Now, we we showed this on uh, we broke I broke this tape down for the on my block show and you can just see like body positions are terrible and you can, it's very easy to see why you get they got run through. Here's what I'm going to say about the when you when you make the comment about Joe Barry there. Here's my pushback. Somebody's got to coach it in practice. Yeah, that's fair. like it, it's it's not it's not obvious. Like if you if you and I are standing next to each other and some dude tries to run between us, I'm not going to just sit here and guarantee that you and I just are going to get hip to hip and knock that guy on his ass. You know what I mean? Like yeah. someone's got to coach you. And if you're not, if you're not, and I, you, again, I'm not at practice every day. I can, I'll guarantee they don't do this or they do it at the requisite speed, to, you know, and, and intensity to be good at it. You can, you can just tell the way they operate. And so if you're not addressing it all the time, every day, in the way that you communicate and the way that you go about your practices, if you're not doing that, like we used to teach, when I was doing skill development, Andy, I would take individual players or small groups of players before and after practice, and they'd have tackling sessions during the season. Every day, because if you, otherwise you're not good at it. It's yeah. not. It's like it's not rocket science. And so if you're not doing it, it's whose fault is it? You know, the, is it ultimately the player's responsibility? Yeah, but man, you're you're a coach in the National Football League, and your guys can't tackle. They can't tandem tackle. It's on you. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think that's well said. And then the other play that I wanted to break down was the fourth down play. And there was a lot of confusion on this one because I posted it and everyone thought it was the fourth down play at the end of the game. This was not the fourth down play at the end of the game, which um, was also a unique play. But uh, fourth down, when the Lions had their touchdown drive, decided not to kick the tying field goal. Instead, they go for it on fourth and two. It's a well-run play. Um, You've got a little bit of a bunch to the left side. They go in motion and Jair's playing off. And then the receiver just cuts out to the left and it's just the easiest, ultimately ends up about the easiest pitch pitch and catch you can possibly imagine on a fourth and two um, when kind of the season's basically on the line, they pick up the first down, they ultimately get a touchdown and uh, Lions ultimately win by four points. Your thoughts on that fourth and two play. 
I think it was a good call. This, you know, Ben Johnson and, and the guys over there, Brunel, they just they understand what, what's going on Packers defensively. So Packers, so everyone wants them to play up, and they're right. They should play up here. Why don't they? Well, because when you come down in motion, and all of a sudden you're in a look where they can switch release, which they do, right? Now the the inside defender and Jair, if they're on the same page and they switch release, these guys, someone's, I guarantee you, someone's getting lost. I mean, that's the easiest way to get lost if you're standing. If you're standing side by side and somebody switch releases on you, somebody's there's going to be two guys going to one guy and the other guy's going to be wide open. So that's why they stack or that's why they play off. So like Jared can kind of make sure that the other guy, you know, whoever, the, if the other guy makes a mistake, he can re- recover for it. That's right. what you do in the field. Now, when you're in a fourth and one or fourth and two situation, you have to tighten that down. Obviously, you see what happens if they don't. Um, this is a this is just another situation where where, you know, you always talk about Bel- Belichick and situational awareness, right? And playing situational football. So one of the things that he would do is he would call that same defense, for example, but they would practice. Okay, guys, it's fourth and one. What does that mean? Where can they, what are they going to do in this look? What are they probably going to do? If they all bunch down, they're either going across the field or they're going back out. One of them's probably doing one, one's probably doing the other. So we need to get down and we need to play this at a little bit tighter because situationally, if they, if they just turn around and catch the ball and fall over, they now have a first down. So, it's the situational stuff where they call in a play and now you have a contextual, you have like contextual awareness as the defensive back to go. I know coach just called this play. It's fourth and one. I remember we practiced this contextually. I understand what the situation is and now I can, I can get my alignment, right? Right. This isn't the, this isn't just a field play anymore. This is a fourth down and short play. So I think that's the difference that they're lacking. So it, it seems to me, and again, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here. It seems to me that this has happened far too often through the course of the season where you have situations where it's third and short, fourth and short, they're playing in their kind of standard coverages and there hasn't been that situational awareness. You mentioned it kind of before where like ultimately at the end of the day, that comes down to coaching at the same token, you've got Jair Alexander there. He's your highest paid corner. You want him to be able to recognize that, come up and make a play there's never, there's usually not an easy, like point your finger and that's the person to blame. I'm sure this is part coaching, part uh, execution, but like, is that just football IQ on the field or is that ultimately just like, Hey, they're not coaching it well enough. And it's, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to say without being in there. I, I would say this, like Jair Alexander, you know, for all his, Jair Alexander believes he's the best guy in the league. Right. I, you know, I used to kind of think it was all a little bit of smoke and mirrors with him. But after the, you just kind of, he, he thinks he's that guy. And yeah. So if you're that guy, you know, if you're that guy, you have to tell your coordinator, your defensive backs coach, I'm that guy. And you need to put me in positions where I can be, I could be who I am. If I'm a damn lion, let me roar. Yeah. And sometimes they just sit back and they do, you know, they put them back here and, well, we don't want to get beat deep and in 2021, 2022. We were, you know, we didn't have the same defense. So we're playing a lot of that shell and we're letting you go, you know, you know, down the field to the 20 and then trying to tighten up. Everybody in the league was doing the same thing, it, it seemed like. But as these players develop, they develop their personalities, they develop their talent, their, 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 their kind of awareness about themselves in the league. I think you have to start allowing your players to lose games for you, right? Like you want the player to lose the game. You don't want the coach to lose the game. And Jair Alexander is one of those guys where – I don't know if I was a believer at the beginning of the season with all his stuff, but like, I'll tell you right now, like if that guy tells me yeah, I'm willing to lose the game, all right, man, go lose the game. You know, you win it, you lose it, but I'd rather take my chances with him than on a bad play call. Right. And that's, and, and I think just to expound upon that, like it's, it's putting your faith in, in the right players to lose the game for you, right? Your, your Rogers, your Jairs, your Kenny's, your Rashawn's when he's healthy. It's like those players, you're willing to give that leeway and say, Hey, you know what, if that guy beats Rashawn, if he beats Jair, if if Aaron messes something up, like we can live with that. We can go, you know, we can go back to the film and say like, Hey, we, we put our best guys in a position to succeed. It didn't happen on this day. We can live with that instead of, you know, again, Jair being five yards off the ball on a fourth and two completion that could have theoretically decided the game. Yeah. I, I, we, I, as, as players develop, you just have to give them more and more leash. Right. And, and yep. you just see how much you just see how much they can take. And, and certainly in this situation with both those guys, really. I think the pack, I think, you know, listen, if, if they got beat deep, I, 
if Jair Alexander gets beat deep right there, I don't think anybody's going like, oh, what a dumb play call. Like, I just, you know, I don't, I don't think they, they care, first of all. They should But yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the players in the building. The players in the building and the coaching staff, they're going to be, oh, it was a bad play call. It's like, dude, guy, guy, guy got beat. Sometimes you get beat. You know, Brett throws five picks against the Rams. We're not like, oh, come on, coach. You know, we're just like, oh, shoot, man, you live and die by the sword sometimes. That's how it happens. Yep, totally agree. One million percent. I, as people try to diagnose this game and this season, uh, we're all going to be, you know, shooting darts and trying to figure out who's ultimately to blame. There's four names that are going to come up. Good against LaFleur, Rodgers, and then uh, Joe Barry. Those are the you know, generally the four names that come up the most. Um, I don't know that it, we don't need to go in Goody today. That's another conversation for another day. Uh, we, we talked about coaching at the onset. There's obviously blame to point there. And I should point out that, of course, we have the ability to have nuance and say it's never just one person. There's a lot going on here, nor is it just those four people. Um, but I do want to ask your opinion. We'll start with Rodgers and then we'll go to Barry. What was your opinion on how Rodgers played in this game and maybe more importantly, how he played on the season as a whole? This was actually kind of a, a, a good proxy for the season, I think, in that I feel like he was – I remember there's a couple times in Brett's career where I you kind of feel like he's pressing because it's not there and he wants it to be there. Yeah, And that's how I felt about this watching Aaron, this – not this game, but really this season for the most part, is there's a there's a there's a – almost an innate level of frustration as he enters into every game, knowing that they can't quite do what he really wants. There's not, um, I don't think there's, there's a good mesh between what he really, really wants to do and what Matt wants to do. And there's, there's always that power dynamic and that power struggle. Um, there's a, a lack of communication or, or whatever it is between the, the guys who are on the field. Like he, he probably has great communication with, with Randall Cobb and Mercedes, but it's like, well, they're the young guys are the guys that are going to be playing. So there's there's that development portion of it. I think there's a lot that goes into it, but it does feel a little bit athletically, he's no different. Um, mentally, or or from a from a football IQ standpoint, he's no different. Um, but there there does seem to there's a feeling like at least I see uh, the way his facial expressions, his body language, his reactions to things, he's pressing and he's just pressing because he's frustrated, you know. And I know it comes off a bunch of different ways when he's on Pat McAfee or when he's you know the guy's very very well spoken, he's very very thoughtful, and he's very smart. But he's a football player, man. He wants to be and he wants to be the best football player that ever walked the face of the earth. Right, and so he's and so he's frustrated and because he's frustrated. He's pressing a little bit more than maybe he should, or maybe he, he, he looking back, he'll want to he'll want to have. Yeah, I think that's a really good observation. And I, I look at the two throws to Aaron Jones down the sideline, the one that should have been picked, and then mm -hmm. the one that was picked that got called back due to penalty. It just feels like again, he's he's kind of pressing sometimes a little bit. Um, you know, maybe throws that he could have made didn't end up happening on this day, but to go right back to it on basically the other side of the field and have basically the exact same result to the exact same safety. Um, it does feel like there's times that he's pressing. And I, I, the whole vibe that I got this year was almost identical to the vibe that I got in like 2017, right before um, Matt LaFleur got brought in at the end of the Mike McCarthy era. It just in 20, in 2019 and, or excuse me, in 2020 um, especially, but even in 2021, a little bit, like you could see this sort of like resurgence from Rogers where it was like having fun again. Like he was going out there, he was doing the bell, he was doing celebrations and like, you could just kind of see him having fun. And then, but if you go back to just like the, the couple of years before LaFleur got here in those last McCarthy years, like everything felt so painful. Every drive felt so painful. Like everything just was like a complete and utter grind and it just seemed like he wasn't having fun. He was getting frustrated with receivers super easy. And then, like I said, you, you sort of had the, the, the first year under LaFleur where it was kind of like that feeling out phase. 2020 was phenomenal. Like, he, that's where he was like, no question MVP. Then 2021, he wins the MVP again. He's having fun out there. And then 2022 just felt like it harkened back to those end of McCarthy days where everything was a grind. Everything was frustrated. It wasn't fun. That, that's just the vibe that I got. It's too much work. Like yeah. it's too, it's too much work for him. Um, and I don't mean like physical work. It's like too much of a mental and emotional strain because really this year, you know, you just mentioned it in your, you know, a couple of minutes ago, like where else are they going to look? What do they, what do they do? Well, 
They don't do anything well. Yeah. You know, so if, if you don't do anything well and you're the best player in the league for the last, you know, however many years you want to call it, or, you know, arguably, well, then like literally the entire burden of this football team falls on him. And like people, people want to talk about like, why do you think he does all this stuff? Why do you think he says what he says? Why do you think he goes on Pat McAfee show? So he's trying to control things. Like, why else would you, you know, that's why he does everything that he does. He wants to control the narrative. He wants to control the narrative about his career. He wants, he wants to control all this. And right now he's in a situation where like, you just took away his best player, who was by the way, the best player in the league, like in his position. His other best friend has been hurt from half the season and all of last year. The line that he used to have isn't there anymore, right? Josh Shitton's not there anymore. Yeah. You know, TJ's not there anymore. Corey Lindsay's not there anymore. Those guys are gone. That's a problem. That's a real problem. They don't have a tight end like they used to have. Tunyon's been coming back for an He's not the same guy. I mean, you got all these things going on, and they're still like, well, we got all these weapons, man. You just got to learn how to use them. Go get them. Five-time MVP coming up. And it's like, I'm not... I'm not passing judgment on how he handles his bit. I'm just, it's very, if you're an armchair psychologist, man, it's not hard to figure out what's going on here. You know, he's, he's just frustrated because there's just too much that he has to do for this team to win. Yeah. It does feel like he is like, he, he's having to anticipate what players are going to do rather than knowing what players are going to do. Like you can't just like when, obviously when Jordy and Devante, like those guys were on such the same wavelength that like they could basically complete passes with their eyes closed and know what they were doing. Um, and at times with Rogers was legitimately no looking because of that. Uh, but you have now, like, he's just, he's got almost like take an extra hitch to see if somebody is like actually in the right spot at the right time. Like he's sort of anticipating. There've been a lot of throws this year that like, even like the um, the Tunyon one and the like that Tunyon had to go up and get even the Lazard touchdown on this one that are just like a, a tick behind and you can almost just see him like taking that extra like quarter second to be like all right is it is it really going to be like where I expect it to be I think you can kind of see a little bit of that as well. I would choose, I mean if you don't if, if you don't have that connection with guys which he obviously doesn't or at least to the level that he's had in the past with you know with, with Jones with 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 Jordy all the you know. Even Greg, you know, he, yeah. Donald, God, I mean, you just start going on the, the legacy of players that he's had here at the wide receiver position. It's it's difficult. And when you say, you know, it's interesting that you you make a comment that this is this feels like the year before Mike left and, and Matt showed up. Because if if you were to ask me, if you were to ask me is the, what's the frustration level like? The difference is Matt Matt is much more willing to concede power to Aaron. So he doesn't have that person who's doing this, right? Right. But you have the same problem. Like you had the feeling out phase, you had the honeymoon phase where you know it's the same thing. It's just accelerated now. And what you're dealing with is you're dealing with a guy and like every like I don't know Aaron. I've met him a handful of times, right? I don't know the guy. Every player that I've ever met that is like that, you're like you're you're an art, you're narcissistic, right? You're super super confident, and you're you're like Mensa smart, okay? And those are all not bad things, right? But when you now are looking at, you're putting together this offense, you're doing this, you have these expectations, and you put there's players that don't know what they're doing, there's coaches that you're not confident that they can develop guys that are there. I mean, there's all of these things going. There's calls you have questions about. You, you're, you're trying to switch everything. It's like, hey, I got my playbook. You got your playbook. Like, it's it's impossible for him not to get frustrated. And I'm not I'm not uh, giving him a pass for getting frustrated. It's just I'm just telling you, like, it's easy to see from A to B how this all happens. Can that continue? Do you think that it's best that Rogers and the floor continue this for another season, or is it time to? Maybe go in separate directions. Yeah, see, that's a great question. I mean, I I don't think Aaron changes. And we talked about this a huge power dynamic problem in the Green Bay Packers, right? Because of everything we just talked about. Like Aaron Rodgers has has written checks for other people in that building for, for a decade. Yeah. Right. Aaron Rodgers from a football cachet, football intelligence, on field perspective and performance, outranks Matt LaFleur, I don't know, fifty to one, a hundred to one. Like it's not, they're not in the same breath. Okay. Matt LaFleur is the head coach of the football team 
And generally speaking, when you come on to sign, Matt LaFleur has the best coach, has the best coaching job in the world, in my opinion. He gets to coach the Green Bay Packers. He gets to coach a Hall of Fame quarterback. He also has one of the most difficult jobs because he was like 40 years old when he showed up. Nobody knew who he was. And he has to coach a 40 or 38 year old quarterback who's about to be a four time MVP, first ballot Hall of Famer, who's immensely smart guy, narcissist, and super confident. And it's like the day, the first day he came in, it was like, well, we're going to work with Aaron. We're going to work with Aaron. It wasn't like Mike Holmgren, Mike Sherman. Mike McCart, it's my way. It's my way. I'm the head coach. My way of doing business. You're going to come and go. I'm going to get new coaches in here. They're going to get hired. I'm going to get new players through free agency. I'm the one. The buck stops with me. He didn't do that. No, he didn't. And not. so four years down the road, when you finally see all the cracks coming out, because winning hides a lot of stuff, right? Now you're eight and nine, and all the stuff's coming to the surface. It's really been there for a while. What are you going to do now? Because you already conceded all the power. You can't take it back. So I don't know what they do. It's going to be extremely, extremely interested or interesting to see what ultimately ends up happening with this. I, I go back and forth. I, I, I think the simplest explanation is usually the one or the simplest like path is usually the one that comes to fruition. And the simplest still feels just like Aaron's back and you don't mess with all the other. Like, I don't know. I think it's very interesting. I think it could go in a lot of different directions. Um, and then really quickly, Joe Barry, your thoughts on his performance this year and, and the seeming dis like, so it sounds like he's going to be brought back this upcoming year. I thought it was interesting given everything this year, the disappointment of the season, this wasn't like, listen, every team gets injuries. Um, but I don't know that you point to injuries and say, well, this is the reason that we weren't what we thought we would be. This is a really good team on paper on defense and they were not very good. They were they I mean, they're, better they're, after the injuries, arguably. Like, you could argue that, like, they actually played better at the end yeah. of the season without Stokes and without Gary than they did earlier in the season, which is crazy. But sorry to cut you off. No, yeah, it's a good, that's, that's a very good point. They're, I mean, it was 17th in the league, right? I mean, they're painfully average. So um, I thought it was interesting, given that, that Matt's like, you know, we're not, you know, not going to look at anything. He's going to be back. Everybody's going to be back. Everybody's happy. Um, Joe Barry... I don't know. You know, this is this is. Listen, I, it, it's such a tough business, right? Because you have you. Res I re I really have a deep respect for NFL coaches, man. That is a tough job. Um, it's it's bad hours. It's terrible job security. Um, you just get you know you guys like us talking about it all the time. But also, like you look at his track record, you're like, well, what did you think was going to happen? He's never demonstrated that he's like this top coordinator, like some mastermind that he's like all these guys are playing really well, like. He picks up like a ton of fifth round picks and turns them into studs. Like that's never happened. I, I didn't, nobody ever saw that, you know, in, in his past that suggested this would be any different. So, you know, it, to me, Joe, if, if you're going to keep Joe Barry fine, if you want to keep your coordinator, you want to get a new coordinator, do whatever you listen. You need to get really good at fundamental football. If Joe, if Joe Barry or Matt LaFleur or anything decided that, hey, we're going to be like the best of the basics of this sport, we're actually going to take time and practice to be better tacklers communicate better, we're going to be better blockers, and we're going to practice with a higher intensity level. I don't care what you call, you'll be a better team. Like I, I, In fact, I would bet my house that this team would be in the playoffs, regardless of like all the injuries. You could take, you could pick any two players not named Aaron and not take them out off the team right now. And I guarantee they'd be in the playoffs if they just did those things and spent more time on it. So like whether Joe Barry is there or not, like it ultimately is the buck stops with, the head coach is the head coach going to demand this out of his guys, or or, or is he going to let them just go? Well, you know, we're just going to get better. Let's keep working on it. Keep getting better. I think it was uh, my my buddy Ross Uglum who said if you if you uh, hire Joe Barry, you know, knowing what his previous uh, you know record had been, and Joe Barry shows up, um, that's not a Joe Barry problem. That's the person who hired Joe Barry. Like if you if you saw his body of work and that's the guy you wanted, and it, he comes in and does the exact same thing that his body of work had previously showed, like that's not Joe Barry's problem. That's the I don't know. It, it's an interesting thought. I thought the other interesting thing there was like Matt Lafleur the the Sunday night after the game. He said 
listen, it's not been good enough. We need to go through everything with a fine tooth comb and identify right. all the things that are wrong. And then within like 12 hours, yeah, everyone's going to be back. Like all, every coach is, is, is good. Like I expect everyone to be back. It's like, dude, you what you fine tooth combed in like uh, 12 hours there. Like that's, that's impressive. some fine tooth combing. That's impressive. Fine tooth combing. Like I couldn't believe that. Like it went from so drastic to like, we've got to, we've got to look at absolutely everything to, but, but not the staff, the staff, the staff's good. They're perfect. This is what this this is the NFL. When I talk about two businesses, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, honestly, this is this is the cold reality of like National Football League. That loyalty supersedes the mission sometimes. Yeah. And unless like and, and especially in the Green Bay, like you don't have an owner being like, now nah, someone's got to go. Yeah. They don't have that. You know, this is you just saw. I mean, his his brother just got fired, right? Well, his brother got fired. Yeah, his brother got fired because Robert Sala ha has to fire him. But if you think Woody Johnson and the, the Johnson ownership group didn't say something to him, you're crazy. You know, like so heads roll because the guy at the very, very top is like, hey, either you pick four people to, you know, to scapegoat or I'm picking you. That happens at every level. Right. And so this is it, it's going to be hard because there is this like all these guys know they're going to be out of a job eventually. And when they're out of job, they're going to come looking for the guys that hired them right now. To you know, to hire him back or or you know, you know, switch switch roles. That's what happens in the National Football League. Mike, phenomenal stuff as always. Any final takeaways or thoughts on this season before we uh, wrap up for the year? I'm actually looking forward to uh, the playoffs. I just think playoff football is really fun to watch. It's just an added level of um, there's just an added level, added level of intensity in the air. Uh, you know, the guys that are like in cruise control during the season pick it up a little bit, and it's. It's just it's a fun time. There's gonna be some good games on this weekend, but this Packers thing, man, it's it's uh when you when you hear stuff like you just said in particular, like the twelve hour turnover, fine tooth comb comment, like it it uh, you know, Aman and I were talking about this today, man. We are all we care about when we are around players, like how can we make players' lives like how can we make them better? Like we we got to live this like really great life, really cool. We live live out our dreams, did the best we could. Ended earlier than we wanted it to, you know, get injured and all this, stuff, but like you got to live your dream. And so when you can help other guys do that, you want to do it. And when you see some of the stuff that happens now in the league because the priorities are changing, it's it's sometimes hard, especially in you know, in situations where you see a lot of talented, good, hardworking kids that are maybe not being in the put in position to be successful. It's gonna be an extremely interesting offseason. I'm really uh, intrigued to see where Green Bay goes. Uh, if they do ultimately make some changes, what happens with Aaron, what type of roster they're able to put together. They're behind the eight ball a little bit when it comes to a salary cap standpoint, 15th pick in the draft. There's a lot that's going to happen that's going to change this team. Um, could be a franchise altering offseason, depending on what happens with Aaron and Jordan and some of those sort of things. So going to be uh, in interested and intrigued to say the least. Mike, it is always great talking with you. We will definitely stay in touch uh, throughout the offseason. Thank you so much for doing these every single Friday throughout the course of the year. I know I learned a ton from uh, talking to you all year long. I'm sure the, the listeners and the viewers have as well. So thank you for taking the time and I uh, can't wait to talk to you soon about Pack football again. Excellent. Excellent. I'll talk to you soon, Andy. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.